actually an attack that happened in October um, when I was previously in Ukraine um, and I left and went back to uh, went to Israel. Obviously, a lot of attention uh, shifted to Israel at that time. And so it was something I always wanted to go back and write about more. And what had happened since I was last there was that uh, it had come to light that uh, the informants who were responsible for giving the Russians details um, of where they ended up attacking were actually uh, two Ukrainian civilians who'd been living in the town themselves. So they had betrayed their own neighbors uh, to launch this attack that ended up killing 59 civilians. And this is an attack that happened, as you say, uh, back last autumn. But Russia is now rumping, ramping up its attacks on Ukraine and a lot of concerns that um, President Putin is gearing up for a big new offensive. That's absolutely right. And that was another reason for going back to this area, because although it was uh, liberated in 2022 in, in uh, the autumn when Ukraine took back a large uh, area of the north uh, east of of Ukraine, uh, the Russians are now back on maneuvers in that very area. So back in this village where people thought, you know, the nightmare of occupation was over, you can hear the fighting going on about 30 miles away. And there are fears again that there could be, you know, a, a repeat and that that, that that area could come under Russian occupation again. And we had the, a big focus at the NATO uh, meeting of uh, foreign ministers earlier this week about uh, getting arms through to Ukraine. We know, of course, that that big package of supplies is still being held up by Republicans uh, in the Senate. Um, what is the situation for Ukrainian troops now? Are they still lacking some of the military equipment and technical support that they need? Yeah, I mean, I think the number one issue that they have is actually uh, personnel, their numbers, uh, and and hopefully that will change. Now there's going to be an another mobilisation, so they'll have more reinforcements. You've got people who've barely left the front line in two years now. Uh, they they are low on ammunition, and they do talk about uh, having to ration that, which is obviously a huge issue for them. Uh, what they're really struggling with on the front line now is a new phenomenon called glide bombs which are essentially uh, dumb bombs they're not they're not guided but and they're dropped by uh russian air um, aircraft flying near the front line uh, and they put fins on them so they can direct them a bit more but they're very lethal uh they're very hard for the ukrainians to battle without an air force of their own of of any you know substantial numbers they were still waiting for uh pilots to be trained in f-16s and for them to get f-16s that they were promised uh eight months ago, I think it was. Um, so, you know, not only are they looking forward to the fact that they need the further supplies, they still don't have what they've already been promised. Well, let's consider where NATO goes from here. I'm joined to do so by Anne McElvoy, head of podcasting at Politico. Hello, Anne. Hello there, Carol. General Philip Breedlove, our former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. Good evening, General Breedlove. Good evening to you, Carol. And Heidi Hotala is Vice President of the European Parliament and a Finnish MEP. Good evening, Heidi. Good evening. Thank you all so much um, for joining us. I mean, we saw this week this extraordinary um, uh, cutting of a, a big chocolate cake um, to celebrate the 75th anniversary uh, of NATO. Um, but it, that, that was almost a, a jarring photo opportunity at a time when um, the alliance is facing huge challenges, warnings of what is to come, um, in, in particular for Ukraine. Um, Anne, what did you make of that gathering that we saw this week? I think, as, as you suggest there, Carol, they were a bit hamstrung about what the visual messaging was. And the mood is very sombre about Ukraine at the moment. We heard that urgency in the clip that you played there from David Cameron appealing to the Americans to get the next big tranche uh, of military aid through Congress. And I think that's also a sign that time is really running out to help Ukraine materially in the next stage of the war. At the same time, if I could defend the chocolate cake, because a lot of my colleagues, including my some of my political colleagues, thought it was just a terrible misstep um, because of 
not only that, but obviously there's Israel Gaza going on, there's a lot going going on and going wrong in the world. But you do need to make NATO feel like a place you want to be as a country and to message that sort of positivity. You'll be part of a defence family. Article 5 says an attack on one is an attack on all. So in a sense, you're, you're putting up your commitment. NATO is obviously trying very hard to get people to pay more into the pot of their GDP. You have to make it look a bit like it's also a good thing. It's not just something that is defensive in the sort of more measly sense of the word. And General Breedlove, well, let me ask you about that that big question um, which was directly addressed by David Cameron about this huge package of aid that's being held up in Congress. Uh, President Biden has been uh, appealing to lawmakers to release it. I mean, why is that money still being held up? Well, thanks for having me on. And um, I think that we are kind of in the crazy season here in America as we have this election coming up. And one side of that election wants to force change on our southern border. The other side of the election wants to use uh, money to support Ukraine. And, and each are using those as tools to try to affect the outcome of the coming elections. I think what you have seen uh, before this sort of uh, primary season began, you will see again after the uh, election is settled, and that is the the largest portion of Congress is is firmly behind Ukraine and funding Ukraine. And so once we get past these political tools being used, we'll we'll get to a little more sane peace. Just to finish. Yeah. You made an important point, though. There is a sense of urgency. Ukraine needs aid right now. And uh, David Cameron had it very correct in my mind. And um, Heidi, I mean, your country is one of the newest members of NATO. Uh, and being there with a, a border with Russia, you must be very conscious of that Russian threat. Yeah, that, that's of course right. And uh, if I compare the Finnish public debate, debate in the media, uh, what it was uh, five years ago, ten years ago, it's totally different because now there's no uh, hesitation to say that Russia is um, is a threat. It's um, our our very new um, commander of the Finnish Armed Forces, though, said that it is not an acute military threat. But we can see that the uh, NATO and um, the allies need to prepare for all kinds of cybersecurity operations. And um, I, I'm very happy to see that, that NATO is paying more attention uh, to this dimension. Today, we, we read that um, uh, in Prague, uh, there is this um, uh, observation that um, Russia might be, Russian hackers might be uh, disturbing uh, railway functioning in Europe. And um, we've seen some some similar cables all of a sudden uh, break and things like that. So NATO is very important uh, for Finland in many ways. And this, let's say that everybody understands here that there is no gray. It's not good to be in a gray zone between, let's say, the east and the west. That you know you have to choose your sides. And Finland got finally a year ago completed its. Uh, its membership in NATO. And now, of course, we're very pleased to see that Sweden has been a member for one, one month already. And uh, concerning the Trump threat, I need to say that also quoting the new <laughs> commander of the armed forces of Finland, uh, he, 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 thinks that he seems to believe that now this is a wake-up call, the, the, the possibility that Trump will become next president in the US is a wake-up call for Europe to get its act together. And of course, I, in the big picture, I count the UK very much a part of, of uh, UK and also all allies. But we cannot trust uh, the US being there forever. But of course, I agree that there's an urgent need to get the package of, of uh, assistance to, to um, Ukraine. Done. Yeah, let me no. ask you, Heidi, we had that warning this week from the Polish Prime Minister, Donald Tusk, saying that Europe itself is in a pre-war era and, and that Ukraine must not be defeated by Russia for the good of the whole continent. I mean, do you really fear that um, this is a conflict that could spread beyond Ukraine's borders? Well, th there's so many ways of, of putting this and I'm, I'm very eager to hear from, from uh, the uh, other other participants in this debate how they see it. But um, I believe that um, we have to be prepared that um, uh, 
you know, in the worst case, if uh, Ukraine loses to Russia, then what what is Russia's real target then? Is it um, is it uh, is it Moldova, which could also be uh, like a small thing in between? But uh, is there a real chance that uh, in the, the period of some years, indeed, that Putin might really consider grabbing uh, and and you know crossing the border to one of the Baltic countries? In Finland, I'm not so sure about them, but there is this uh, perspective that uh, Putin is uh, speaking out on his uh, his uh, let's say empirical visions. And um, at, until now, he has realized many of them. So I think we have to be prepared and the whole societies must be prepared. And that's why, by the way, the, um, uh, the commission's president, Ursula von der Leyen, has asked the, the, uh, the former Finnish president, Sauli Niinistö, to draft a report for the EU about the kind of a whole of society approach to security, including obviously cybersecurity, but more than yeah. that. So we need to be prepared in one word. Uh, and um, Anne, we know it's not just um, America that has been struggling with this argument about how much aid to actually give to Ukraine. Um, I mean, right across Europe, there have been these battles going on, haven't there? And in the meantime, we keep hearing from Ukraine that they are in desperate need of more supplies, more cash, more money, um, more equipment. Yeah, I, I think there are different cases, however. I think in America, this, this Congress is is really a victim of near gridlock in Congress, and it's part of a bigger package with lots of other bells and whistles uh, attached to it, like these big bills that go to Congress end up, something like, as they used to call them, Christmas trees with everything hanging off them. So I think I, I do actually uh, agree with uh, my fellow guests that I think that there is a bipartisan desire still very intact in Congress to help Ukraine, but it has to get through this slightly difficult part and it's taking way too long. I think in Europe, the problem is a slightly different one. I'm not yet convinced they really do want to spend the money. I think a lot of countries are relying on someone else to do it. And I think we've seen that, or indeed, if it's a country that's prepared to spend a lot of money, if you actually look at the spending chart, Germany comes out pretty high, certainly uh, yeah, ahead of the UK and behind America. But there's certain things it does not want to do. It doesn't want to send Taurus. It doesn't want to send weapons, long-range weapons, which it thinks will make it a party, or Olaf Scholz thinks that as leader, will make it a party to the war. So sometimes it's about money, sometimes it's about will, and sometimes it's about are you prepared to provide the hardware? It's not a problem the UK has, because we are pretty out there and saying we will support you, we will train you and we don't want to, to give you fighter jets until we're pretty sure that you know you can, um, can can use them and that we can train up Ukrainians who are very, very fast learners at this and very committed. But obviously it would be irresponsible to do otherwise. I think there are lots of different problems and that's where you need everybody to come together. And instead of saying, well, here's what I'm having difficulty with, they have to come and say, well, here's what I'm prepared to really push on that is difficult for me. I'll take one thing, you take another. I think that's the only way that this is going to work in the next months. And General Breedlove, I mean, is there this sense really that Europe still isn't or that many European nations are still not really um, pulling their weight when it comes to NATO? Well, I think there is that sense and I believe it's false. If you look at some of the reporting about who's doing what in a per GDP basis, on a per GDP basis, the United States is 13th or 14th in the list. Many nations are giving more per GDP than America. And now, as we know, the, the sum of European contributions now are higher than the U.S. contributions. It's about 52% to 48%. So very few in America understand that. And there's not there's politicians that don't really want America to understand that because they want to use our expenditures as a, a point. If I could just make one point, we talk a lot about um, material and money and weapons, mm -hmm. but I would offer to you that I think the most important thing we need to give Ukraine right now from the West and certainly from my country is a clear declaratory policy of what we're about in Ukraine. We don't have nations standing up and saying, we're going to support Ukraine until all Russians are removed from sovereign Ukrainian land. In America, we tend to have these two statements we use all the time. We're going to give them everything they need, and we're going to be there as long as it takes. Well, to a military man or woman, that's two incomplete sentences. We're going to be there as long as it takes 
to do what? Throw a party, cross the river, run Russia out of the country. Uh, and it's the same with we'll be there uh, for as long as it takes or uh, to give them everything they need. We need to have a declaratory policy. Once we have that, then the contributions and what we give to Ukraine becomes much, much more clear. Um, and General, I do want to come back to you on this question of um, what a future Trump presidency might mean. But um, uh, just briefly, Anne, do you think that is a problem mm -hmm. that there is a lack of clarity on exactly what NATO's goals are, other than for Ukraine not to lose? We haven't they haven't really spelt out exactly what that is. And indeed, even in terms of the um, commitments that they've given in terms of weapons, that is something that seems to have gradually evolved. Um, I think that's fine. I, I don't, I'm afraid, entirely agree with the general on this one. I believe in much more in a degree in geopolitics at, at this, where the stakes are so high in strategic ambiguity to an extent. I think we kind of know, in, if I could, you know, put it put it a bit crudely, in our guts, we know what we what we mean. We mean that Ukraine uh, stays as a, as an independent country, that it is not under the heel of Russia, that it is not governed from Russia, that Russia can't get rid of uh, the government in Kiev on some ludicrous pretext that it's full of neo-Nazis. But whether, when you actually start to get down to saying, well, do you mean that you would, you know, to end this war, you are going to, something is going to have to happen. And it's unlikely, I think, that, uh, for instance, the status of Ukraine will fully revert to Ukraine, um, uh, sorry, the, the, of Crimea, I should say, will fully revert to Ukraine, at least in the foreseeable future. It may later. So I, I'm for not getting too caught up on, well, do you mean every single village in the Donbass or do you mean this or that bit um, of, of certain disputed territory? Sometimes these things can be frozen as in the Cyprus crisis, which allows you yeah. to end conflict. And I think that is, to me, more important than than perhaps I think we just have an honest difference of opinion here that, than, than saying that you have to know exactly what you think the end status is. We've been discussing the future of NATO. Uh, we know that, of course, there is a US presidential election coming up later in the year and Donald Trump um, certainly put the cat amongst the pigeons when he uh, raised questions about uh, what a future US administration's approach to NATO would be, particularly towards some NATO members if they hadn't paid their fair share. Um, Heidi Hautala, um, there in Finland, uh, are you worried about what a future Trump presidency might mean for NATO? Well, I have to, to say that the, uh, this um, is... Um, an opportunity, almost an obligation for, for let's say, the European pillar of NATO to, to be more serious about capabilities. And um, as you know, it's been uh, lagging behind. So let, let's make it a challenge because, uh, you know, future will be uh, uncertain in many ways. And the, the Trump uh, threat, as I can put it, is, is one of them. So anyway, I believe that the, now is the, the golden opportunity for the EU to get its, its defence uh, cooperation uh, and, and its uh, material uh, cooperation on, much of, on a more solid basis. And that's what now I believe that the EU is, is planning to do. So let's use this opportunity because we cannot indeed only rely on, on the US as, as important as this transatlantic connection is. Yeah, I mean, General Breedlove, um, Donald Trump said, well, look, uh, if a NATO country was attacked and that was a NATO country that hadn't been spending enough of money on its own defence that, you know, maybe the US wouldn't be willing to help them out. But he subsequently seemed to qualify that. Um, do you think this was perhaps just a bit of a... Um, the, the businessman Donald Trump negotiating and getting European members to cough up a bit more money? Well, I, there's several ways to look at this, uh, and I've talked to some of those close to him, and and they remind me that you need to read chapter six of his book, which is when you're beginning a negotiation, start with a basically an unbelievably high bar so that you can be seen as a good person negotiating back from that high bar. And so I think there are those that believe Donald Trump is trying to start his second conversation with NATO. And I think it's important to remember that we've already had uh, four years of Donald Trump with NATO, and NATO came out just fine on the back side of it. And, and while there were some rough patches of language used, 
in the end game, several nations have determined that it's time now to, as, as Heidi mentioned, to begin to invest in themselves. People tend to forget Article 3. Uh, yeah. They want to focus on Article 5. And Article 3 says that, in, a, in my uh, Southern American words, defense begins at home. You have to invest in yourself and then also invest so that you can support uh, the rest of the alliance should okay. you be called up. And uh, then I just make one last point. I mean, NATO has been through some really exciting times in its life. I remind people all the time, we're not nearly where we were once before, where we were thrown out of a capital of Europe and had to migrate the whole headquarters to a neighboring nation. So we have we have come through some challenging times in NATO, and I think NATO is going to be very in very good shape in the next 20, 30 years. Tr Trump Sorry. proofing the um, NATO yeah. alliance. They, they have they, they've been yeah. sufficiently worried to be discussing that, haven't they? Yes, yes, but it's providential anyway, isn't it? I mean, you know, if you've got any sort of risk to NATO, it's a good message also to send to 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 Russia and to uh, to other potential foes. Um, I, I, for what it's worth, I, I think that what Donald Trump, I do, I think this time I do agree with the, the, the general. I thought his opening remark is absolutely right. All Donald Trump wants to do is be seen to shake down NATO to pay their dues, and he says it in this forceful and sometimes overly blunt way. I think there is, you know, I work a lot on this on interviews on, on the the power play podcast I host, just trying to find out what people are likely to do and what they're thinking. And I, when I talk to people in foreign policy. I wouldn't say establishment around Trump, but certainly people I think who would be would be in the State Department in the White House if he won. I think there is there are more of them who think that NATO would be part of his vision than not part of his vision. I think he has to be watched a bit on what he might do to to end the the war in in Ukraine too precipitously. But I think it's absolutely. He wants to be seen to win, and for him, if you can turn winning into being good for NATO, then by Trump's standards, it's not a bad deal.